Our programs offer many languages. Please visit suprememastertv.com forward slash schedule. Nos programmes offrent plusieurs langues. Veuillez visiter suprememastertv.com bar oblique schedule. Nuestros programas ofrecen varios idiomas. Visiten suprememastertv.com barra inclinada schedule. Nuestros programas ofrecen varios idiomas. Accesi suprememastertv.com barra schedule. Hamare karkam pesh kye jate kai bha shame krupya deke suprememastertv.com forward slash schedule. 我们的节目提供多种语言，请看supremastertv.com/schedule。Rancangan kami menawarkan banyak bahasa. Sila kunjungi supremastertv.com/schedule.Baramujunamatwafirabiladidimanelogatyurjaziaratsupremastertv.com/forward/schedule. Наши программы предлагает много языков. Пожалуйста, посмотрите supremastertv.com, касаясь черта schedule. Наши предавания предлагают много языки. Более вишты suprememastertv.com на клонной черта schedule. In the beginning of that primordial time of our world, uh, this being, they don't need to eat anything. This being, they don't eat anything because they came from the third world or second world, yeah? or even astral world. And they don't eat anything. Therefore, they can fly everywhere. Yes. And uh, they just live their life almost like the way where they came from, like from heaven. Please continue watching to find out more. Supreme Master Ching Hai's lectures are not a complete meditation instruction. Please do not try alone. For free of charge guidance, please visit godsdirectcontact.org or contact any of our centers near you. Today's episode will be presented in English with subtitles in Arabic, Olaxis, also known as Vietnamese, Bulgarian, Chinese, Czech, English, French, German, Hindi, Hungarian, Indonesian, Japanese, Korean, Malay, Mongolian, Persian, Polish, Portuguese, Punjabi, Romanian, Russian, Spanish, Telugu, and Thai. Hangao 和旅游中心处处可见赏心悦目的植栽印度人和欧洲人成为一处民族大熔炉各种族有其独特的文化一年四季都有缤纷的特殊节庆大家一起同乐体贴的观众很高兴为您介绍非凡的新加坡
青海无上师三十多年来，与神圣教理照亮世界。这位完全开悟的名师，传授观音法门，帮助渴望的求道者即刻开悟，一世解脱。所有开悟名师都修观音法门，如佛陀、孔子、古鲁那那克、耶稣基督、老子。祖奎师那、摩诃毗罗、先知穆罕默德，祝他平安，还有很多。他强调，我们只要时时想念上帝，为他人无私奉献，遵循宇宙律法，将达到人类最高国位，了悟来到地球的目的。青海无上师慈悲为怀。是非凡的在世典范，经常援助难民、皆有灾民和需要帮助的人，给予物资和经济援助，以爱心抚慰他们。青海无上师表示，深深感谢挚爱的上帝，多年来的恩赐，给予能力，略尽绵薄，为苦难同胞提供。物质方面的帮助、抚慰并支持他们，且能力行慈善，将上帝的爱与慈悲传达给他真爱的儿女。青海无上师获得各组织团体、政府、媒体和各界人士的支持与爱戴，并获他们颁予许多奖项，例如。二零零六年故事和平奖，此奖等同东方的诺贝尔和平奖；一九九四年的世界精神领袖奖；二零零八年摩诃毗罗奖；二月二十二日和十月二十五日都被定为青海日、美国荣誉公民等等。他卓越的人道善行，多年来获颁无数奖项。博得世人无数赞誉
由于篇幅和时间有限，请恕我们无法列出许多其他奖项与荣耀。致力为动物发声的青海无丧尸，提倡和平爱心的植物饮食。他更许下宏愿，希望人类醒悟，众生皆神圣，缔造和平辉煌的纯素世界。动物和人类共存共荣。他以各种方式倡导纯素生活，例如广发传单，您也可以选择这样的生活；开设爱家，国际纯素餐厅、纯素食品公司、纯素皮草产品和无丧尸电视台。他也经常呼吁。政府和媒体领袖，并参加气候变迁视讯会议。无论世人是否警觉，其努力影响世人自惧，唤醒人们选择善待动物的生活，并奉行慈悲之道，天下才能永久太平，救地球免于气候变迁及天灾。青海无丧尸多年来足迹遍布全球，从美国到非洲，欧洲到大洋洲，对大众和他的徒弟讲经开示数百场，阐释各种灵性主题。今天我们有幸为您播出其中一场精辟的开示，主题为“师徒之间”节目。《楞严经》是决定清净明慧的断偷与断妄语，七集之一。二零一八年十二月二十三日，以英文开示于台湾新地，台湾又称福尔摩沙。Grandma is here. New stuff. Bling bling. <laughs> bling bling, Fred. You know. <laughs> I joined the brothers. <laughs> bling bling. <laughs> ah, okay. This is called something like. Enlighten or something like that. Awaken. You know better than I do. God, what kind of designer who doesn't even remember what she designed? Told you, Grandma. Huh? She <laughs> forgot many things. Too busy. Too busy. Too busy about things. It's not important. Some important. Some are not. Okay, hi then, beautiful people, <laughs> handsome guys, tough group. <laughs> okay, how are you today? You have good uh, food. Yes. yes. Enough food. Yes. Okay, that's the main point. <laughs> yeah. Far away from home, no wife, no husband, <laughs> no beautiful karma children. If no food, then what to live for? <laughs> what come here for, right? And bring in the weather so that you know you're at home, especially the western from England or something, huh? 
This weather we don't need, okay? Ah, they bring all kind of present, you know? Present that I don't always want to have. Okay, now, get down to business. No matter what, I have promised you to read you this sutra, so I do it. I'm just wearing this so you know I'm getting old. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Uh, I don't know, when I see you, I feel okay, better. But when I'm at home, I don't want to go nowhere. I don't want to get out, I don't want to dress up. Uh, I don't want to even eat. Today I did not eat. My lunch or breakfast, they took it away. <laughs> when I first came here, I told them, okay, make me a kitchenette, you know? Just uh, outdoor. Uh, I like it to cook under the sky. Okay, fine. I had one. Very simple. Just though the electricity that you plug in, turn the knob, voila, cooking, right? Sometimes when I don't eat the food, I eat the whole day waiting there, it's too cold. I warm it up a little bit. Yeah? Or I warm some medicine, yeah. I okay, it's all good. Oh, I'm happy. Very simple. Just one little, like something that you put the... Uh, the <laughs> the, the the balls and the stuff in there, huh? Shelves, yeah, yeah. They put balls and chopsticks and stuff. Okay, wonderful. And a little electric cooker with the a two pot on it. Ah, I'm happy. Yeah, exactly what I want. Simple life, cause my life is complicated already. I cannot just play with them. These and push it button and push that button and push that one again. And then wait until it glows. You know I'm, I'm just turning the knob. Simple. It cooks us the same. Yeah? Why trouble? It's just modernized, you know? I am not very more. I'm cave woman. Remember caveman? <laughs> I just sought out the cave a few days ago only. <laughs> the cave tradition is still hanging on, you know, all over. I'm just wearing this so you know I'm civilized, you know? <laughs> I left the cave behind. <laughs> huh? Oh, yes, of course. When I see you, I look good. I feel better, yeah? I guess because of all of your eyes and heart, all oh, expecting great things, you know, from the master. <laughs> and this energy, you know, kind of, how you say, boosts me up. Uh, Lifted me up. Oh, thank you for your lifting me up. <laughs> I could do with some uplifting. <laughs> okay, now let's get down to business. Serious business. Buddha business. We should really thank the past masters, monks and nuns and scholars who have taken time to record the Buddha's teaching after the Master's Nirvana, and also for the past and present persons, lay or monks or nuns who have really dedicated themselves, sacrificed their time and precious health or under any difficult situation to translate this so that I can read it to you. And we have to thank them. And may they be blessed forever by all the Buddhas past, present, and future. May their merit be immense. May they be liberated forever. Thank you. According to Buddhism and the believer and the tradition, when you read sutra and all that, you have to put on incense, flower, you know, and bow to the Sutra first and thank all the Buddhas and Bodhisattva in ten directions, all respectfully, before you read it, okay? And then you cover the Sutra also with silk or, you know, beautiful cloth, and I just make it more popular, yeah, more easy, simple. And I apologize to all the Buddha. I say, if I've done something wrong, according to the tradition, my heart is full of respect. It's just that I cannot always do that. So please, all the sin, whatever I've done wrong, is all on me. At least other people, they hear the names of the Buddha, 
according to the sutta, they will get benefit. Yes. Okay, yesterday we were talking about the Buddha saying that uh, a monk, you know, real monk, should not wear any silk, should not wear any leather boots, yeah. She, in his time already had boots, silk, and furs, furs, you say it here, yeah. Okay, camera, zoom in so that they know I'm telling the truth. Zoom, 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 zoom. <laughs> you see this one, this part, yeah. Buddha said everything here, okay. All right. Yeah. Buddha said so many things in here that could offend many people, offend many businesses, just like I do. Maybe that's why some people say, this is not a Buddhist sutra. It's not Buddha who said that. Nonsense. If Buddha didn't say that, who said that? Huh? I wasn't there, <laughs> was I? No, we were not there to tell people, be there, go green, nothing. It was a Buddha who said this. That's why I said to the team, put the Buddha vegan, not vegetarian. Vegan. What's a lot of Jainism? Mahavira. He was also vegan. He even advised, not, not allow, but he advised his disciple to not to even eat root, not to dig the root to eat it. Because it might hurt the worms. You know, the worms in the ground. There are some roots that don't attack worms. So you can eat, but there's some root maybe attack worms, and by the digging maybe we hurt the worm. You know, all the master are so compassionate like that. Yeah, are you Hindu or sister? Hindu, right? Yes, yes. Hinduism also emphasizes ahimsa in any form at all. Yeah, not to talk about going to war or killing animals to each other, to insect, to everyone. Now, Buddha is no exception. Uh, the Lord Mahavira is no exception. So, not wear silk, not wear leather boots, not wear furs, not wear down, you know, from the anim from the birds, the, the geese, young feather, yeah? yeah? Originally, I thought only when the feather fall, fall down naturally, but maybe by the demand of the industry and the people, maybe they pluck, especially their little chicks. They care nothing. You know, chicken, it is a male, meaning no more, cannot produce egg. They just throw them in the drain and then just grind them and then die. Oh, I cannot sleep for many nights thinking of this poor chicken. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. So you don't even consume milk. I mean, the monks, yeah, the Buddha talking to the monks now. Not even cream. Cream is from the milk, yeah? Not that kind of cream. Not soya cream or soya milk that we are using nowadays. Because it's vegan, it's okay. And then butter, non-vegan butter, is made from milk. You know that, right? Yeah, in the old time. They churn the milk, make into butter and cheese. But in the old time, even then, the Buddha was already very strict. Yeah? In the old time, they don't have this kind of uh, industrialized animal farm. They don't confine them into a little cage until they could move no more and all that. And still the Buddha said, no. Not to talk about nowadays, they just abuse them and force them until they could not walk, they could not stand no more. This is really cruelty at the utmost. So no butter even. Then this person who avoid all this will really transcend this world. Ah, okay. When they have paid back their past debt, they will not have to re-enter the triple rim. Oh, for avoiding this, you will not enter the three rim. Meaning? Hell, hungry ghosts, and born as animals. Animal without this kind of uh, holy essence, not like Buddha when he was born as an animal, just to make affinity with other beings, yeah, with animals and all that. 
Also, astral being is another three, three realms of existence, which is the low heaven beings, the humans, and astral beings. Yes. But don't say that all the astral beings are, are low and bad. No, just like if you read the, the book from Yogananda, huh? his master, she used the word, Giri. He's in the astral world just because he was appointed to be there to teach, you know, the astral beings. These astral beings could be his former disciples also who has not been able to ascend further. Yeah, and the master, of course, will continue to stay there to teach them all the way up to the fifth level. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's why Jesus promised, I will never leave you, nor forsake you to the end of the world. And that, many words, not just this word only. So this is a promise of a real master. This is true like that. But hurry up, okay? <laughs> Don't stay in the astral level. <laughs> and thinking, oh, Master will come and take me anyway. It could take long, long years. And you see other brother and sister on other religious uh, group or passing by you with flying color, and you're sitting in the astral world and thinking, when will I get up there? When? <laughs> when? <laughs> when? It's just like here. If here you don't practice diligently, you go up there, it's the same. If you don't practice diligently, then just stay in there. It's like when we study in the class and we are lacking behind. And if you're lacking too long, then maybe you have to be recycled again uh, so that you become human or others, so that you can continue to learn maybe with other masters if you're lucky, you have enough merit. It depends on what you want, really. All right. So now, so being a vegan, avoiding all animal byproducts doesn't give you complete liberation. The Buddha say only he will transcend this world, not s world, and with a d. Okay. Okay. Meaning, okay, you be able to avoid the hell, the being hungry goes or be reborn again. Uh, as animals, you know, like domestic animals, working very hard. I told you the story about a, a soul who was born in different animals, and when he was born as a horse, he also fed up. He tried to kill himself. Remember all that? No, I don't think you do. <laughs> it's a long time already. <laughs> if you have to listen to all my lectures, I think you will grow old. <laughs> it's a big bird here. Yeah. All right. He tried to kill himself as when he was animals, different animals, but he never succeeded. Even if he succeeded, he was born again in another animal. And then tried to kill himself, but no, no use. Your karma has to last until the time's up, having master or not. Even the Buddha, he mentioned here, maybe later. Mm. Yeah, not here, not here. After, we have more to come. You see that? You see how long it lasts here? Huh? You see how much I have to study, do my homework for you? <laughs> and before that, I do homework before that also, to check out anything else. And then I keep reading and I lost the pages. Oh, I just keep looking again. Where is that demon? <laughs> Where is the demon? Because the Buddha was talking about demons, understand, that uh, possess the uh, practitioners when he or she not mm, vigilant enough, okay? And then I lost the page, because I keep reading, reading, and then I forgot, and then something, or maybe dogs barking, or somebody bugged me, somebody or something, and I forgot what page. I come back to keep looking many hours until I find it. There's no index here, so that you cannot find where it's what. Oh, my God. A lot of fun, eh, for you. <laughs> Very funny. The Buddha also asked them, why is it because when one wears something taken from living creature, one creates condition with it? Just as when people eat the hundred grains 
Their feet cannot leave the earth, the ground. Meaning, in the beginning, why Buddha say this? In the beginning, in the other kind of sutra, you know, I don't remember which one, the Buddha mentioned that. In other kind of sutra, when the Buddha talked to someone else before, a long time ago, long before this one, and the Buddha mentioned that in the beginning, when this world just began to form, yes, and there was empty, vacant, and then uh, the Brahman being came to establish his throne here, and then he was lonely, and he was thinking, oh, I wish some other beings would join me. And then slowly other beings would join him. In the beginning of that primordial time of our world, uh, these beings, they don't need to eat anything. These beings, they don't eat anything because they came from the third world or second world, or even astral world, and they don't eat anything. Therefore, they can fly everywhere. Yes. And uh, they just live their life almost like the way where they came from, like from heaven, yeah? The heaven people, they think and they just get what they want. They think and they just fly. If they want to go to Kaohsiung, they think of Kaohsiung and they just go, huh? flying. No need airplane, no need buying, booking, passport, nada, next. How nice. That kind of life is heavenly life. And then... Uh, slowly they live in the world, you know, then they bore, they play, they frolic around, and then one day they saw some form that uh, manifests itself on the sea surface. And then they taste it. Oh, it tastes good, uh, sweet and nice. That's the first time they ever tasted some physical substance. Okay, and then, oh, they continue eating that. It can taste sweet. I guess it's see wheat or something in the very uh, uh, primary form, yeah? They eat, they like it, and then they eat, okay. And later they begin to feel like they should eat. Ah, they, they get, get the habit of eating. And then they're looking, there's no more form around. The sea doesn't supply enough, so they go look something else. They see some, uh, some crawling plants or some with flowers and look good, so they tasted it. Mm, it tastes good. <laughs> So they continue eating that. And later they saw some fruit from the trees, and they try that. Ah, then they eat that. Oh, it feels good. And so they continue eating one thing after another. And later they found some grains, you know, like, and then corn and stuff like that, that abound on the earth's surface. They keep eating one thing after another. And then the more they eat, the shorter they can fly. The more they digest these earthly food, the lower they can ascend their body. And then their body begins from the etheric body, from the light body, it becomes more and more coarse and dense. And then slowly they cannot fight, fly no more. And we are the descendants of these. No flying people, according to Buddha, okay, story. Now, the Buddha mentioned here, like a human, like the human who eats 100 kind of grain, meaning a lot of grain, doesn't mean we eat all 100, but, you know, like 500, <laughs> 2,000. 800 kind of grain cannot leave the ground, cannot lift his feet up from the ground. That's why. That's why I want to explain this to you, why the Buddha say that. Got it now? And then, it doesn't end there. After that, they eat the grain, yeah? And in the beginning, the grain is a big, huge kind of round thing. Like, okay, the rice, for example, the a grain of rice is as big as, I don't know, maybe a few meters uh, uh, circum- circumference, you know, round like that. And then uh, at the time, whoever needs to eat, that grain will just roll and roll to the door of that person. But later, they keep eating too much and the grain becomes smaller and smaller. 
maybe the merit has di- diminished, yeah, until smaller size, and they become more and more human, you know, earthling like. So, so the grain becomes smaller, so they will use it, and uh, and then it's scattered on the ground, and they grow into smaller grain, yeah. But nevertheless, it grows a lot, a lot, a lot. So more than enough for everybody. And they grow all the things, they fruit, vegetable, fragrant herbs, all that. Okay. Everyone, they grow on the field. Everyone wants it. They just go out and get as much as you need. Okay? Tomorrow go get again. And then slowly their form changes from from like a genderless, yeah, becomes they are different. Depends on how much you eat. The more our ancestors eat, the less beautiful they became. And then their form changed. You know, depends on what they eat or how much they eat. It changed into men and women. And then it become the desire. The desire be born out of these the different shapes. And, and then uh, they begin to you know, do things to each other. And then everybody else who doesn't do it yet uh, point at themselves, how can they do that to each other? You know, we're brother and sister. Oh, that's very bad, very bad. And they begin to then hide themselves. They start to have to find some place to hide. Then they start to live in cave and all that. And there's not enough cave then uh, as people begin to desire each other and try to couple with each other. And then so they build houses, and then they need land, and then they begin to possess this land is mine and then put fence around it, and then later, uh, because they are too busy with each other, men and women, they're lazy. They don't want to go out into the field where the food were growing for them, so they don't want to go every day to get it, yeah? And then so they go out and take a lot, a lot, a lot to their home at one time, so they don't have to keep going out again. And therefore, it becomes food shortage. Yeah, and then they begin more and more trouble, you know, conflict and fighting, and then possessive, and then begin to say, this piece of fruit land is mine, that is mine also. I harvested yesterday, today will be mine again, next week, next month, next year, all mine. And then it begins the trouble, fighting, competing. And then the government are born. Because somebody has to uh, interfere with all this fighting and arguing and quarreling. Okay, and then you have police, and then you have army, and then etc., etc. And we inherit all this until now. Mm. So, now you know. So, the Buddha continued. This is Buddha talk now. So, both physically and mentally, one must avoid the bodies and the byproducts of other living beings by neither wearing them nor eating them. It's so clear. I read word by word, yeah? It's not me, yeah? I say that, Buddha, Buddha said, I say that such people have true liberation. Then, finally, they also have liberation if they don't eat meat. I guess if they don't eat meat and wearing animals or using animals' products, then they are at least liberate from the three lower incarnation. And then because they continue to do that, they have no more bad karma, very little karma. Then when any master comes, they would be able to find him. The master will find such a pure and karma-less people to save them. Then, of course, finally, they will be completely liberated. Yeah, sooner or later. So that's why the Buddha say that such people have true liberation. The Buddha said, what I have said here is the Buddha's teaching. I mean the saints teaching, eh? not just him teaching, but him in the lineage of the saint, the Buddha's lineage, the saintly lineage. What I have said here is the Buddha teaching. 
any explanation counter to it is the teaching of Papayan, I mean the heretic, or atheist, not true teaching. Further, now Buddha explained something else, some other precepts, okay? We had, you know, like uh, purity from lust, no more lust precept. And now a uh, killing precept we just done. And now Buddha continued to expound further about the uh, non-stealing. So Buddha said, further, Ananda, if living beings in the six paths of any mundane world had no thoughts of stealing, they would not have to follow a continuous succession of births and deaths as well. All these precepts are paramount, important, so that you can be liberated, at least from a lower birth uh, of existence. And then slowly the Master will take you up higher. So the Buddha said, your basic purpose, meaning to Ananda and the monks at that time, your basic purpose in cultivating samadhi is to transcend the wearisome defilement But if you do not renounce your thought of stealing, you will not be able to get out of the dust, meaning this kind of dusty world, the earth, yeah? Even though one may have some wisdom and manifestation of Chan Samadhi, mean meditation Samadhi, one is certain to enter a devious path if one does not cease stealing. At best, one will be an apparition. On the average, one will become a phantom. At the lowest level, one will be a devious person who is possessed by a made ghost. So it's no good. All of them, no good. <laughs> Even the highest, the middle and the low, no good, no good. These devious hordes have their groups of disciples as well. <laughs> Imagine that. I thought only I have disciples. <laughs> I could, now a ghost, ghost even have disciples. Fancy that. I was so proud, and now I don't think I'm proud anymore. Huh? Even ghosts have disciples. <laughs> what a big deal about me, huh? <laughs> having disciples like that. <laughs> These devious hordes have also their groups of disciples. It says of himself that he has accomplished the unsurpassed way. You know, I mean Buddhahood, enlightenment, complete enlightenment. That's what I mean. Unsurpassed. Nothing can compare to their way of accomplishment. That means they are on top already. After my extinction, the Buddha extinction, in the Dharma and in age, these phantoms and apparitions will abound, spreading like wildfire as they surreptitiously cheat others, calling themselves good, knowing advisors. They will each say that they have attained the superhuman abilities, enticing and deceiving the ignorant or frightening them out of their wits. They disrupt and lay waste to households wherever they go. Very destructive group of ghosts, of uh, apparition. I teach the big shoes to beg for their food in an assigned place in order to help them renounce greed and accomplish the body way. The big shoes do not prepare their own food so that at the end of this life of transitory existence in the triple realm, they can show themselves to be one's returners who go and do not come back. In this case, the Buddha means triple realm, meaning this world and a little bit higher huh? to the Brahma. So when you pass all this world to pass the Brahma realm, then you are truly liberated forever. So in this case, if the big shoe, the monk, do whatever the Buddha has listed above, then he will surely be liberated. Yeah. 
And see, they never come back. Yeah. Once returners who go and do not come back. Okay. Then why does he say once returners? Ah, it could be that they have returned already into this world one time only. Yeah, already. They exist already as a human, as monks, but they will never come back again. If they go up to the higher level, they will never come back again. Truly liberated. Ah, okay, got that. How can thieves put on my robes and sell the thus come one, saying that all manner of karma one creates is just the Buddha Dharma? The Buddha means that these people, the one who are not worthy of monkhood, the one who doesn't keep the precept and just put on the robe, look like a Buddha or a monk, and cheating others, you know, selling the Buddhas even, meaning just repeat what he said, but don't do anything as the Buddha did, and just cheating people just to gain their fame and richness, comfort, life, or make people respect them, bow to them, just, just to gain their own benefit. So the Buddha warned the people about this kind of monk, just the same like Jesus has warned uh, his disciples and the gener- later generation that beware of the wolf in lamb clothing. Yes, after Jesus died, there may be a lot of wolf like that uh, proclaiming his teaching for their own benefit. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of true because even within religion, same religion, there used to be some wars and a lot of bloodshed. Remember, in the name of God, same God, same religion, not like different religion even, and still the same Many recently as well, yeah? Up to the recent years, still in the same name of the same religion, same God, fighting, bloodshed. Oh, what a sad thing. Hmm? So the Buddha continued to say that these so called monks, yeah, so called fake monks, will slander those who have left the home life and regard um, big shoes who have taken complete precept as belonging to the path of the small vehicle. Because of such doubts and misjudgments, limitless living beings fall into the relentless hell. Not only these people they sell the Buddha teaching for their own benefit, but they also misled other people to fall into the wrong concepts, the wrong way of life, and or go to relentless hell. It is non-stop punishment, uh, relentless. Uh, no respite is what it is, right? No stop even for one second. In some hell, you have a, a tea break. <laughs> well, I told you that story. But this hell, no respite, continuously. You cannot die, you cannot live, nobody helps you. Nobody hear your voice. You don't hear any of the saint's name in that kind of hell. You don't have even a nanosecond to even think of anything good, like saint or Buddha, Jesus, nothing in such a hell. In, in such a situation, it's make do you like that. Make you completely forget about everything, just suffer too much, you know, relentlessly, continuously, that you cannot even remember one nanosecond about the Buddha or anything. This is a terrible hell to fall into. And it goes on forever. That's why they say non stop and relentless. Ah, I wouldn't wish anyone to fall into that kind of hell. Please keep the precept. At least you won't fall into hell. Even if you don't believe me, don't follow me, keep the five precepts for your own sake. Don't have to believe me. Just be a good person. Meditate if you can. If not, keep the five precepts. If you 
anyone who keeps the five precepts and never kill anyone, never has harmful thought to anyone, at least he can be reborn again as human. Even if they eat meat, but because they don't know, ignorant. And they eat meat, but they have never killed themselves. Uh, they never kill the, the animal themselves. Then they still continue to be born as human until their merit run out before they even meet any master. If they meet the master, any enlightened master who has the power to liberate them while they're still in human form, that's a lucky people. Because their merit is still have to, attain, to, to remain as a good human, healthy and sane intellect to understand what the master is talking about and follow a master. But if their, their merit run out or they became handicapped or mentally uh, un- incapable, then even they meet the master, useless. Understand? They don't understand what, what is it all about. They have to understand what the master is teaching in order to uphold it, to follow it. Then they can be liberated. So keep the five precepts. Always think good, do good and help others if you can, then you'll be surely reborn again as good human. Have a decent life or maybe a rich life, depends on how much you give and how much heart you have while you're giving it, how pure you, you are when you're giving. Yeah. Then you'll be rich or medium, rich or poor accordingly. Okay? Yes. Uh, Master also no, no exception, eh? Not because you are master and then you can just live recklessly and disregard it of the law or no helping people, no sympathetic to people and no charitable heart, or, then also no good. <laughs> eh, actually, before you became a master, you must have been trained all that already. Otherwise, you couldn't be a master. What I meant is, even you have become a master already, but your karma in the past life, you have not paid, still have a little bit, then it will double, triple, hundred times more so that you suffer more than normal people. Okay, I say that big shoes who, after my extinction, have decisive resolve to cultivate samadhi, and who, before the images of thirst come ones, I mean, the Buddhas can burn a candle on their body or burn off a finger, oh God, or burn even one incense stick on their bodies, will, in that moment, repay their debt from beginningless time past. Okay. They can depart from the world and forever be free of our flaws. Our flow mean uh, fault though they may not have instantly understood the unsurpassed enlightenment, they will already have firmly set their mind on it. Now I want to explain to you something. Burn the candle or burn the incense on your body. And that was because the Buddha is not there anymore, okay? And some people are so earnest, want liberation, so they do some kind of little sacrifice on themselves. Therefore, if you became a monk or nun in a Mahayana tradition, yeah, just like I did, they put some incense on your head yeah, to burn it. I still have three holes here. <laughs> some burn even more, but three is the minimum, just because of that, because is it believed that if you do a little sacrifice like that, you will be free from sin. You set your mind truly, firmly on the path of renunciation and to help yourself and sacrifice for others. This is a symbol of sacrifice and disregard your comfort for other beings in the future. Yeah? Because to be a monk, your ideal is to liberate others, to help others, to understand the holy teaching, not for yourself only. So anyway, uh, some burn more afterward. But at the time of ceremony, for being a monk or nun, they give you three burning incense only. It burns until your skin burns off. 
it, the incense is small like that, okay? And then it keeps burning until it burns to your skin. Yeah. And it did hurt. And if you want to burn more, you do it at home. Because at the time of uh, uh, taking the precept, the foreign precept to be a monk and nun, there are so many people. So there's no time to burn more for you. But you can do that more at home. Of course, your head are all shaved already, so it's only the skin, the tender skin. And you burn where the most tender, right in front here. And that is a symbol of self-forgetting, self-dedication, self-sacrifice, so that you remember that you must do everything you can to help others, okay? Right, all right. So that's why you're here. Okay, huh? I explained that to you now so you understand more, huh? Yes. So if you want to become a monk or nun, for example, like that, na, in this uh, Mahayana tradition, you have to be vegetarian. Yeah. And you have to burn your body, your head somewhere. Head is easy for them because the head is shaved, shaved clean before that, and then they put incense, it burn, burn until it burn your head, your skin. And then after the incense has burned to your skin and the incense has no more burning, it's only ash. Then they will take the ash away and they give you some cool uh, watermelon to put on it. And they take care of you very tenderly, though. Very nice people. So that's a, the Buddha said that. The Buddha gave many, many methods to purify yourself because he knows after he left, there might not other, they might not be able to, to meet any other master. Even if you met a master, you will not understand it, you will not know. So if you continue to follow the Buddhism, and if you do this and that, then the Buddha will also be connected and help you somewhat. So it doesn't matter which tradition you follow. The original master will also try to help you. It's just the problem, it's a human that rejected. Jesus, for example, Jesus always tried to help, invisibly, but humans that reject him. Or the Buddha reincarnate even, or Master, any, they reject him. They're waiting for Maitreya, they're waiting for second coming, third coming, fourth coming, they're waiting forever. <laughs> That's why I don't want to make a Qinghaiism. Because if I registered our group as an ism, then we have more privilege, more easy access, more easy. Doing anything is more easy because we are religion. Nobody can touch us, but we are just an association. Even then, people still think I'm trying to do something. Oh, I am trying to do something. <laughs> I'm trying to awaken you and other people, whoever I can. But it's very difficult for any master to come down. After any master come down, they make a coat out of it. They make an ism out of it. And then the other master come later on, or the same reincarnated master have problem, <laughs> you know, by his own teaching, <laughs> previous teaching. I told you before, uh, in my ashram before, Sihu or other place, I don't have any building. I use all my money for helping the, the poor, the worse, the less fortunate than us. Yeah? I told you because you still have a home to go, right? Uh, homeless people, they don't have. Or the disaster people, they have nowhere to turn. To. Yeah? Even if you get wet here, tomorrow you go home, you have dry clothes. Okay? Even if you sit in a tent, so what? Huh? You, even you have a tent. Disaster people, they don't have a tent. Homeless people, they don't have a tent. Therefore, I use money for other things. <laughs> I did not build any ashram at all. And then I told you, uh, don't worry. Just wait until I die. You have a lot of churches, maybe. <laughs> Qinghai churches, possible. You see, after Bu the Buddha, when he was alive, he go begging for food. And now, beautiful temples everywhere. And if the Buddha reincarnated, he has to pay a ticket to go in, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or have to buy some incense or fruit to make offering or something. Or have to registers as a Buddhist or something, or the same with any religion. When I was in the Himalaya, <laughs> I normally sit outside and meditate on, on, in the, on the rock or somewhere outside, you know, outside in the forest or something. 
But some days it's too hard or too, too, too cold or something. I went inside one of the temples to sit. <laughs> and the monk kicks me out. <laughs> out? No, you cannot sit here. <laughs> yeah, I just sit and meditate only. And my legs were cramped or something. I couldn't get out fast enough. So I crawl out. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm going, going, going. <laughs> I mean, I'm crawling, crawling out. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. Yeah. Maybe I should have make an offering or something. I, I, I was almost penniless, okay, when I was in Himalaya. All right, continue with the Buddha, huh? If one does not practice any of these token renunciations, of the body on the causal level, then even if one realizes the unconditioned, one will still have to come back as a person to repay one's past debt, exactly as I had to undergo the retribution of having to eat the grain meant for horses. The Buddha had to one time eat the grain that meant for horses or other food meant for horses for three months. Mm probably because he has a little bit of debt he did not pay. But if he had burned, probably burned the incense on his body, then he has paid the debt. Then he didn't have to do that. You see, Buddha very compassionately explained all this, and he even confessed his own debt at his own expense, not wanting the disciple to, uh, to, to how say, worship him as a perfect, flawless, enlightened being, but still has some debt to pay from the past life. But this is a Maya arrangement that way, so that the Buddha had to have some debt. Otherwise, how can a Buddha ever had any debt? He's been a Buddha for, ay, you cannot even count how many Ian or Kaupas already passed. He even confessed that. He has mentioned that if you burn a candle or incense or finger, or one incense stick, even one incense stick on their bodies anywhere, you know. He didn't say on the head, but on their bodies. And then will, in that moment, repay their debts from beginningless of time. That's why I became a monk, in case I have debt. A lot of debts before. So I guess I'm free of debts now, and all the karma is yours. <laughs> yeah. Yours karma on me. Because I have burned the incense, not just one incense, but three. The Buddha said here, that means I don't have karma. Uh (laughs) Actually, before that, before I became official monk, I was in some ashram, yeah, you know, walking, going from one ashram to another, looking for masters. And several people always look at me and say, oh, you don't have any karma. Look at my hand, or look at my face. So, oh, you have a bodhisattva eyebrow. I don't know what bodhisattva eyebrow look like, but, but I did have it according to them. And look at my arm and my hands. Oh, you have no karma. Not at all. That was before I became a monk. Okay? Yes. And then I became Tibetan monk, and I became Hindu monk, and then finally became Buddhist monk. I try all traditions. So, if I wasn't cleaned by the Tibetan monk uh, married, then I was cleaned by the Hindu monks married. If not, then I triple it by become Buddhist monk. So actually, I was free of karma. So whatever happened to me is all your fault. Your fault. <laughs> Lovely karma, yes. <laughs> it's nice to blame somebody else. <laughs> it's easy, <laughs> the most easy. Why, you know, it's to blame everybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do the same. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> okay, now. When, the Buddha continued, when you teach people in the world to cultivate somebody, they must also cease stealing. This is the third clear and unalterable instruction on purity given by the thirst come one and the Buddhas of the past and the war honor one in ones in the past. I mean, many Buddha, one Buddha after another, all the Buddhas teaching this way, all the saints, all the thirst come ones teach this way, the precept. 
is important. That's why even if you come a monk or not even you burn incense, or that, you still need to take precept. You take the precept so that you always go straight, you know? I give you only five precepts, and you complain, and sometimes you don't keep some of it. If you become a monk, 200-something precepts, monks and nuns, similar, understand me, in the Buddhist tradition. I don't want to tell you this, because if you know it, you have to keep it, because you're lay people, so I cannot tell you. You understand me? Yeah. All kind of precepts you have to keep, not just five precepts. But these five precepts, even as Buddha mentioned here, are the main one, okay? Because if you don't keep your mind pure from uh, lust, other precepts also will be kind of depleting and, how you say, uh, lacking, okay? For example, if you're lusting after a woman and maybe she's already married or she's unattainable, and then, I don't mean you, but I mean some people who are lacking of moral standard or lacking of self-control, might try to find a way to harm anyone that gets into his way to, to, to possess that woman of his desire. And then other precepts can also be broken. Therefore, the five precepts are the, the mother of other precepts, okay? Right. Keep them, keep them. Keep them with your life, okay? It's not just a written Words. It is your life. It's your guaranteed shine for happiness ever after. Even if you stray from my teaching, keep the five precepts, okay? Because if you don't, you will be very terribly regret when you go to hell and undergoing all kind of payback uh, punishment. Okay, huh? I don't want that to happen to any of you, or anybody at all. But you already been taught right from wrong, so you do keep it, huh? It's not that difficult. Five precepts is a very simple uh, rules which should not be even a precept. It should be like a standard living way of a human, a decent human not to talk about saint or practitioner or anything like that. Keep them. Hmm? In uh, Catholicism or Hinduism or Jainism, they all keep precepts. They all have this kind of basic ahimsa, no harming to others, yes? And stealing is also harming others in a different way, yeah? Because... If you steal somebody money or something that he or she need, then you discomfort that person. You make her and him, or hers or his life, not smooth. And then you make her, him worry and then distracting him or her from their daily routine or efficiency to their work, whatever they're doing. So when you do something, think twice, okay, before you do it. That's all very simple. Whatever not yours, even if worthless, don't take. Very simple, okay? Is that difficult? No. Been told uh, decades already, huh? The Buddha tell Ananda that when you teach people in the world to cultivate somebody, remember because Ananda asked the Buddha, how in the future can I help all the beings, even though I myself are not very highly develop. I'm not, maybe not saved yet, but I want to save others. <laughs> I want to try. So the Buddha teach him all this, yeah? So he continued to say, when you teach people in the world to cultivate somebody, meaning after Buddha is gone, nobody there, then if you want to teach others and teach them all this, all the above mentioned, uh, you know, regulation, precept, principle, okay? And plus, if they want to cultivate samadhi, they must also cease stealing. Yeah? Don't steal anything. This is the third clear and unalterable, uncompromisable. That is the real truth. Nothing can replace it. No killing. No unethical sexual relationship. Okay? No 
stealing. Even if you're married, you have to, I would say, taper off. The master in India, even they are married. Many of them do. Yeah. Because they're married already <laughs> before they became a master. Or even afterward. But they have couple interaction only try three times a year just to make children, to do the tradition family, that's all. Not because they, they're lustful after that, just kind of duty. So this is unalterable rules of the universe that you must keep in order to be liberated, with or without the Buddha presence. Now, therefore, Ananda, if cultivators of Chan Samadhi, in meditators, uh -huh, do not cease stealing. They are like someone who pours water into a leaking cup and hopes to fill it. I mean, useless. Huh? useless. You waste your time. If you pour water into a leaking cup, will the water stay inside? No. So if you don't keep these basic precepts, then no matter how long you meditate, it just keep leaking out, gone, 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 to the Maya power. The Maya will take it and use it to harm you and harm others as well. He may continue for as many aeons as there are fine motes of dust, but it still will not be full in the end. It's like that. If you don't keep the precept, forget your samadhi, forget your meditation. Useless to you. That's what the Buddha would say. All right. I say the same. In Thailand, there was one sister. She had several disciples during meditation, seeing the vision that I was the King Rama V of Thailand. It's not my fault if they saw I was King Rama of Thailand. Understand me? <laughs> Even if I was. <laughs> then she criticized me. Uh, she says that according to her, any decent man will marry only one wife. Uh, the King Rama maybe have more than one wife. I can't remember. The, maybe I'm not King Rama. I don't remember how many wives I had. <laughs> if I did, so what? Okay? So I told her, even if King Rama or I married hundred times or to hundred women, hundred men, I'm still enlightened, and I'm still in focus of enlightenment, and I'm still in heaven. Even Master had to pay some debt, okay? Not, maybe not for the Master himself, but for the disciples, okay? That's number one, okay? Like the Buddha has to eat the horse uh, food, okay? Actually, in some other karma, in some other sutra, they say because of disciples' fault. Disciple karma that he had to do that. And no matter what, okay? There's a master business. Huh? Your business is just to take your precept, keep it, meditate, and be good, okay? Now, for the poor King Rama of Thailand, he was very famous, very beloved by his people, and he did a lot of good things for Thailand. Very beloved king. And any king who married once or twice or third times, it is tradition, it is obligation. Because in the old time, that is the king, you know, they have to marry and have a lot of princes and princesses so they can fill the post here and there, married to the neighboring countries, girls, uh, princess or prince, to tighten the friendship, coalition with neighbors. That's how they do it, okay? Not necessarily that the king likes it. And you don't know what the king's uh, uh, a heart problem. He may have many wives or concubines, but it works like this. Every night he had to pick up uh, from the unknown, how you say, cart, okay? Like, for example, I have two, three, four cards here, okay? A hundred card, whatever. The name is written here, upside down. So I don't see what card, what name of the concubine is coming tonight. I just pick any. Oh, Elizabeth. Ah, okay. <laughs> and then the eunuch will bring Elizabeth to me. All wrapped 
in blanket, ready for business. Understand that? Okay. So the king don't even have any emotion involved in hundreds or how many hundreds of concubines. Just a job, just a work. Whether or not he likes that Elizabeth or not like Elizabeth. Fancy sleeping with somebody you don't like. And every night you have to do it. You don't even know her. You don't even know him. Fancy, huh? You like that? No. No, even if you like women, you can't just like that all the time, right? It's like a job. And woe to any king who favors just one concubine. Then sooner or later, his kingdom fall. You can see that in history. I don't know if your history, but China, for example. Like the Tang, the king of Tang, Ming Huang, he fancy one concubine. He loves only one. And later they hate her. They kill her. And they kill him too. His kingdom gone because of one beauty. Similar everywhere. One time in Vietnam, one king, he loves one of his queens very much. But he, he has to kill her because it disturbed him too much for his state affair. One, one time he sent her with a letter, sealed, with the king's seal, and she cannot open, she doesn't know what is inside. Nobody is allowed to. He sent her to go to one of his generals with the letter. Inside he said, please kill her so that I will have peace of mind to take care of the country's business. He can't allow himself to be too much entangled in this emotional so-called love affair, even though he's entitled to it. Now, this is very sad, but being a king is not that easy, okay? There's other king also, if he favor one concubine, he's not allowed to. Even if he allow himself to do that, the whole court, royal court, or his mother, his advisor, they won't fancy that, they won't allow that. Sooner or later, he has to give her up, or the kingdom will fall, because they will not support him. Because other ministers don't support him. Other, other family, powerful family in the country, who offer their daughters to the king, will not support him. Do you understand? Yes. Because their daughters are neglected. And the king will not fair to all of them, and fancy only one. Then all the people will slowly fall off their favor, and then the king is alone. And with the queen who's been envied, jealous, hated, want to destroy. And then sooner or later it fell. Many times in the history of China, especially like that, you read them, okay? And you know. So to criticize a king of having many wives is not fair anyway, okay? Whether or not I was King Rama or the King Rama have many wives or not, I, who cares? You have to see more, bigger picture. You can't just point your nose into the toilet alone in the house and say, oh, this place stinks. The toilet stinks, but not the whole place. The king, he has duty to his nation. He does everything or did what he can in order to uphold his country, to develop peace with all the neighbors. In order to do that, he had to marry his prince and princess to different countries' royalty. That was in the before. That's how they make peace and, I say, um, coalition together to keep themselves strong. Therefore, he, he doesn't even know who's going to sleep with him tonight. <laughs> it's just a card, you know? They give you every night a card. You just pick up one, and whoever comes will come. There's no, like, okay, every night romantic and stuff like that. It's not... I mean, and if you want to have a romantic one like that, then you do, sooner or later. It's like that. Because these ministers of the king, they love to give their daughter to be the king's favorite and concubine, strengthen also their power, prestige, the whole family, like that. 
Even then, no, no benefit, but oh, the wife of the king, my daughter. Of course, any father wants that, any, any mother loves that. And therefore, the king was offered many from the minister or sub ministers or the generals or the, uh, whatever you name it. Yeah? They all have, if they have daughter, they offer to the king. And the king had to accept it so that they will be loyal to him, support him. Yeah, make him strong and the country stable. If the king alone, how can he, how can he do anything? Yeah, even though he's so called supposed to be the most powerful, but he doesn't have anybody support him. The general don't want to protect him. The minister don't want to help him. The uh, ambassadors don't want to make relationship better with the other country. How the king's going to go on anything? In the old time, relying on that. You see, nowadays we have many, many more better uh, communication system. Yeah, we can go directly to another country. Being a king, you can go directly, or minister, or prime minister. You can go and shake hand with a neighbor country quickly. In the in the old time, you have to rely on all these supports around you, hmm? all support you get. Therefore, he has to have many wives. And he has to be fair to all of them, and that is the rule. He cannot pick one or two or three. Just have to treat all of them. Every night he has to sleep with one different woman. And they take turn, you know. If they have hundred, then he has to keep every night one until the hundred's done and then return. He cannot have one wife, two nights, three nights. Just one. He likes it or not like it. It's like that. Even in China history, one king... He cannot have children. It's just like some men don't have children somehow, you know. Maybe their destiny, maybe they are not potent. So that king has no children at all with all his queens and, you know, second queens, third queens, concubines. No one bear him any child. He is impotent. So what they do? Every night. Oh, every now and then they make a party in the in the in the palace uh, secret uh, chamber somewhere, and they let the young, young, handsome, able, you know, potent men go into there and have party with the concubines. And then all the children are born from there, become prince and princess, and also marry off outside as the royal members. So the king still can you know, uh, strengthen his relationship with neighborhood country, even though he himself has no children. He does that. Very good. You see, so the king has, cannot even afford jealousy, not possessiveness of any concubine, even though if he's important, he cannot even afford to feel bad and then don't let other a man come in and sleep with his so-called wives. He does that for the country. That is the man. No matter how many wives he has, he's a good king. You capish now? Yes. You have to have wisdom, fairness, and IQ. Okay? Not just judging a little petty here, petty there, but it's no good. Okay? It's a little mundane, but uh, you should know a little bit. Okay. Being a king, you know, it's not that easy. Nowadays, king doesn't have to have many wives anymore. But even then, I remember some decades ago, one queen of a country cannot bear children, and the king has to abdicate her. And she has to be dismissed because she couldn't bear children. King have to have children. To continue the royal lineage is an obligation. Obligation. To some nowadays, even the prince is married to some uh, some lady, even royalty or not, she has to bear children and right away, <laughs> almost right away after wedding. Before that, they can be boyfriend, girlfriend for years, but have nothing. After married, immediately have children. You can see that, you know that. We go back to the precept, not going astray from the precepts. Okay. The Buddha continued, 
If big shoes, big shoes, monks, you know, do not store away anything. Big shoes is a Sanskrit term for monks, for renunciates, yeah? And mostly referred to as monks only. Bichuni is nuns, okay? The one who take full precept, 200 something precept, okay? And the dress to at Bishu, I mean real monk, full monk. And the Bishuni is the one the same, okay? Uh, otherwise, you can refer to it as just monk and nun, okay? In this, the Buddha addressed the full monk, the high monk, okay? And at that time, uh, normally in the old time in India, we don't have Bishuni. We don't have, we don't have uh, nuns. Nuns were not allowed in the uh, a monastery. It was before. And then after the Buddha became Buddha, his uh, uh, stepmother, or this submother, you know, because his mother died at his birth. So the sister of his mother took care of him. Mm. And his, that mother wanted to become a monk also under the Buddha. And Buddha cannot refuse. It's his mother <laughs> and then his wife and all that. That's how the nun's order came into being, okay? But the Buddha worried that because his mother is a queen of the country, highly positioned, respected, living in luxury and splendor, how is she going to, to be a humble nun, living ascetic life? Also, a nun is not easy in those days, you know? They don't allow nuns because the woman is very inconvenient to, to travel around, to be alone, yeah? Also, we women have other things, other needs, yeah? And also, if mixing with monks, there might be other things, uh, undesirable affection or thing might come about. So there were no nuns in the order of the Buddha, and at that time also. But the mother, how can he refuse? So he has to make some exception. But he said, even if you are the mother and the queen of the country, you still need to bow to the monks, no matter how young and how old his monkhood, okay? Like how, how long he has been a monk. You still need to bow to them. If you accept that, then I will let you. The mother immediately bowed to all the monks. Yeah, and so see, the Buddha has to keep his promise. Same from then on, all the nuns in the Buddhist tradition, even though they took the full precepts and the full fledged nunhood, just like equal to the monks, they still have to bow to the monk because of that. Not because the Buddha disrespects his mother, but number one, because she has to be humble. Okay, to be a monk and nun, to, you must be humble. Otherwise, what's the you? You just sit there and, 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 and take people offering and prostrating to you. Therefore, the Buddha makes them go out and beg in and all that, just to train humility and lessen greediness, yeah, and possessiveness. So being a monk and nun also has a very good advantage. You train yourself in some discipline. It's a very noble kind of lifestyle, very frugal, very humble, but high living, high thinking, high enlightenment. And now, even if these monks and nuns may not uh, study with me or something, I always, when I see monks and nuns outside, when I pass by in the airport or outside, I always make offering and always make obeisance to them because I respect their ideal. Not their body, but their ideal, their goal, the noble aspiration. I respect that. I always help. I always offer whatever I have in my pocket at that time. Anything. And pay very much respect, humbly to them. Because I think that kind of noble ideal of monkhood as nunhood is very difficult for anyone to follow. And if they can uphold it, they deserve respect. Whether or not they will be liberated or not liberated, I don't know who is high monk, who is low monk. I respect them all, okay? The ideal of life. 
you connect the pieces that we can't get from the Bible or the Sutra. We can read, read, and read, but we can't connect it the way you do it. Oh, really? Wow. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> oh. Thank you, friend. Thank you. I don't know, it just came out. You can see, I always lecture spontaneously, talk spontaneously. I don't have any prompters or anything, whether or not I talk with the public or I talk with you. There's nothing prepared. Well, it's something maybe you have to know or you should know so that it strengthens your uh, resolution in your practice. Yeah? It clears some doubts in your mind. So when you meditate, you're more focused. Hmm? That's also good for you, huh? Hey, one other thing. When people read the Bible, they can associate things with Jesus, but they cannot remember or they cannot associate it with any other master in any other way. And by listening to you and coming to know you and coming to understand what you're saying, now I can connect the Bible. And I really didn't understand it like you think you do, but I can understand it now because listening to the, like, the pieces you put together and the way you can hear one part, and you qu don't quite understand it, but you can remember a scripture or two to connect everything. And this is what you've been able to do. You enlighten, that's why. <laughs> yeah. By listening to talk, you can also be enlightened. It's just one method of enlightenment, one of the 84,000 methods. Yeah. Yeah, some monks in the Buddha's time, just hear the Buddha's voice. He became enlightened, became Ahat. And that's how some people get enlightenment also, okay? It's just that Kuan Yin method is the surest way, the long-lasting and always can rely on, okay? The Buddha say that, but in another retreat, I will remind you again. I don't think we have time for this retreat, but <laughs> another retreat, okay? When you go home, work, take a rest for me, and then I recover or do some more on my job, and then we have another retreat, then we go further, okay? <laughs> if I'm still alive, yeah? All right. <laughs> okay, now. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes I, I'm thinking to myself, can I continue? <laughs> That's what it is. Uh, but thanks to your support and your love and your enthusiastic energy, uh, I survive every time I come out. <laughs> survive. <laughs> yeah, by the way, I want to ask you, why did you cry yesterday? Well, there's, there's a lot, Master, but everything you say answers something that's in my mind. Oh. Um, it's, um, it's really incredible how I can be thinking or feeling or wondering something and you just sort of answer exactly what was in my heart. A lot of the things you were saying yesterday were so um, prescient, uh, immediate to my feelings and my worries and my fears. And uh, you offered me guidance at the exact moment that I was asking a question and you you offered me reassurance at the exact moment that I needed it. Okay. And I am so grateful. Thank you so much. I'm grateful too that you understood. I love you so much, Master. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you too. And your wife too. <laughs> All right, my love. I'm glad it helped you. Mm, you are a good kid anyway. Yes. You're very good. I'm proud of you. In case you worry. I'm proud of you, okay? I think you're a very good kid. Before you came here, even. I saw you on TV. <laughs> you're a good kid, okay? So don't worry. You're fine. Okay, okay so now you know. The nuns uh, in Buddha time begin from there, from the Buddha's time. Before that, they don't allow women to be nuns. Because in India, to, to be a woman, you should never go out alone anyway. Okay, it's dangerous, yes. And uh, you don't mix with men or outside of your family. 
Uh, but the order of um, renunciates at those time and before that is always men, you see? Men, because they are tougher, they can sit outside under the tree to meditate, they can go out for arms alone, they, they can endure more, supposed to endure more uh, hardship than women, yeah? Women is different, uh, different body makeup, less convenient than a man to be an ascetic, okay? In the old time, monks are supposed to be ascetic, yeah? They sit anywhere, they live, they sleep on the ground, they have just a few belongings. Women cannot endure all that. The Buddha was also worried about that, that his mother, you know, second mother, was the royalty, live in comfort and luxury, having servants, you know, day and night. How is she going to bear this kind of life also? Not to talk about anything else. But she was determined. Yeah, she loves him that much, you know, and she believed in him so much. So she determined. And then she has become a good nun. From then on, she became a chief of the nun. So anytime Buddha has some more nun, he will always hand it to her to take care. Yes. She was that enlightened. Yeah, but very humble because she knows, you know, she, she understands the Buddha, she believes him, and she was enlightened. Very good, very good. And, but at that time, originally, the Buddha doesn't want any nun. Even after the mother begging him, he still don't want it because, you know, a royalty and the mother. How is he going to mix in here? Where does she live? How can she endure all this? And is she going to be so snobbish and all the monks will be very afraid of her because she's a mother of the Buddha and the queen of the country? Who? <laughs> These two titles scare any man. <laughs> Not to talk about monks, yeah? And he, the Buddha worried that monks are also very pure and simple. He worried they might feel oppressed, yeah? Uncomfortable around. So he said, no, no. But thanks to whom, you know? Ananda. He kneeled down and begged the Buddha, say, she is your mother. Yeah, you cannot differentiate that she is an ascension being. You preach that all equal. <laughs> he preached back to the Buddha. <laughs> he gave back to the Buddha whatever the Buddha said, equality. All sentient being has Buddha nature. And then say, so I think you should also exercise compassion and mercy on your mother. Then the Buddha has to okay, <laughs> has to okay. So, from, so that's why many, in many Buddhist nunnery, they also revere Ananda photo, Ananda um, image, yeah? Because he is the one who helped them to be able to follow this noble path. But it's... Uh, Maybe it's good for you to know something. Hmm? Yes, thank you, Master. Yes. So that you know why is this and why is that, no? If I just read this faster, but you, you don't know much more than the, um, just the written word. There are history in here. There are background, okay? There are uh, facts. And there are contributions of facts into this and that event, okay? At least you know I'm a real nun somehow, huh? I know something, right, <laughs> about Buddhism. <laughs> I don't know how I know all that. It's just too long ago. I, somehow I just know and I read here and there, I guess, huh? Okay, so the Buddha continues. Mm. More strict now. If bhikshus, at that time no, no, no nun yet, so he just talked about monks. If monks do not store away anything, but their ropes and bowls. Yeah. If they give what is left over from their food offerings to hungry living beings, if they put their palms together and make obeisance to the entire great assembly, humility, okay? Monks have to greet each other that way, yeah? Respectfully, humbly. So, if when people scold them and, and they can treat it as praise, monk, yeah, people scold them, they have to think it's like a praise to them, meaning no feeling of 
uh, rejection or displeasure. They feel in like they are helping them. Yeah, of course they're helping them to train their humility, no? Mm? I'll take away some of their karma. <laughs> All right. So if they can sacrifice their very bodies and mind, giving their flesh, bones, and blood to living creatures when need, eh? if needed, yes. And if they do not repeat the non-ultimate teachings of the thirst come ones as though they were their own explanations, meaning if they repeat the words of the Buddha, they should not claim it's as if it's there, you know, like they're so wise and so knowledgeable. But they probably have to credit, like, first I have heard, yeah, that the Buddha said that, the Buddha said this, yeah. Not like, just talk, 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 like, oh, like he knows everything, just as if he is the Buddha himself, possessing all this wisdom. Then it's like, also like stealing, you know, pretentious and uh, faking, huh? like faking, as if they were their own explanation, they should not, okay? Miss representing them to those who have just begun to study. Then the Buddha gives them his seal as having attained true samadhi. If any monks, you know, who, who are so humble like that and who are so frugal and ascetic like that and also never claim whatever teaching from the Buddha as if their own, uh, were misleading those people who just came who doesn't know who's who, who doesn't know that these teachings are from the Buddha, yeah? Misleading them, let them think that this is this monk's teaching. Then, all that, then the Buddha will certify him as uh, attains true samadhi, mean attain true wisdom, mm-hmm. stabilization in his enlightenment, station. Uh, what I have said here, the Buddha, what I have said here is the Buddha's teaching. Any explanation counter to it is the teaching of Papir. Uh, as usual, he said that. Whatever he teach right here, right now, at that time, was from the saint. Truly saintly teaching, holy teaching. Anything else that is op- opposed to it is no, is wrong. Ananda... Though living beings in the six paths, you remember six paths? Low heaven, human, asura, hell, animals, ghosts, uh, hungry ghosts. Though living beings in the six paths of any mundane world, you hear that? Any mundane world. Meaning the Buddha say that there are more worlds than just ours. Huh? See that? Yeah. All the planets, not just ours. We have been heard in that from your Supreme Master Ching Hai, right? Now is it certified here. <laughs> in any mundane world, just meaning in any uh, earth like this, yeah? Similar. If any beings in the six paths of any mundane world may not kill, steal, or lust, either physically or mentally, these three aspects of their conduct, thus being perfect. And they keep these three mentioned, please say, yeah. Yet, if they tell lies, oh, this is the four now, the four precepts now. Okay, okay, if they kept the three mentioned above perfect, Good. But still, if they tell lies, the samadhi they attain will not be pure. Ah, this is a four precept now. They will become demons of love, you mean this uh, physical attachment, and views, and will lose the seed of the thirst come one. Meaning they will lose their... Uh, Oh, wisdom, their seat of enlightenment to become Buddha. They cut it off. Wow. That means you will never become Buddha if you lie, okay? Even. If you kept the three precepts above, no lust, no killing, no stealing, and, but if you lie, you still cannot be a Buddha. Oh, man, that's very strict. 
Keep it, guys. Yeah. <laughs> as much as you can, huh? So maybe you can become 50% Buddha, 60% Buddha, 80% Buddha. Huh? Or human, at least, yeah? Not running around in the vicious cycle of birth and death in a lower realm. Okay, please keep the five precepts. The Buddha continued. They say that they have attained what they have not attained, meaning these demonic uh, practitioners, that they have not become Buddha, but they say they are Buddha, okay? And that they have been certified when they have not been certified, meaning the Buddha or any saint have not confirmed that they have reached Buddhahood, a great enlightenment, but they go around and boast that they do. Okay, this is the greatest lie, and for this you also will go to the non-stop hell, according to Buddha and other sutra that I read. That's the most heinous lie of all, that you say you attain Buddhahood, but you have not. Yeah? Meaning, deceiving other beings, and then the other beings, they follow you. They also fall into the same pit. That is why it is so bad. Yeah, this is the worst lie you can commit because you lead other beings into the false views with you too, believing in your power when you don't have. So if you go to hell, they will have to go with you. Deceiving. Also deprive them from a chance to meet a real living Buddha. And that's why it's the worst sin you can commit, the worst lie ever. In Buddha, they say it's the greatest lie that you can commit, unredeemable. The Buddha won in his monks here, and the future monks, after his nirvana, that should not do that. Yes. But the Buddha cannot warn the whole priesthood or monkhood after his nirvana. Not everybody read this. Not every monk even know this sutra. Okay? You are lucky to know it. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Being a monk and nun is a very noble uh, position, but you have to really fulfill that position with nobility, humility, and above all, enlightenment before you even go out and preach to others and let everybody believe you. A blind lead the blinds or fall into the pit. Yeah. Continue. Mm. Perhaps they seek to be foremost in the world. Yeah, fame, fortune. The most venerated and superior person Buddha suspect that that's why they say they attain Buddhahood when they're not, okay? When they have been confirmed as a Buddha and they're not, okay? So the Buddha is very polite. <laughs> he say, perhaps. <laughs> he doesn't say for sure they want fame and profit. Perhaps they seek to be foremost in the world, the most venerated and superior person. Perhaps not, yeah? Perhaps I also think maybe perhaps or perhaps not. The reason was that maybe some monks or priests, maybe they just ignorant, yeah? And then puffed up by surrounding followers or a passerby or whoever, and then, you know, and then he thinks he is really enlightened. So perhaps he knows he's not enlightened. Perhaps he thinks he's enlightened, yeah? Because of circumstances. Not necessarily that he won fame or profit, just by the way, maybe, yeah. So Buddha said perhaps. I also say perhaps so, yes. To their audiences, they say that they have attained the fruition of the Pana, I mean, some great enlightenment status, yeah. The fruition of a Sakrida Garmin, the fruition of an Anagamin, the fruition of a hardship the Pataya Buddha vehicle, or all the various levels of bodhisattvahood up to and including the ten grounds in order to be revered by others 
and because they are greedy for offering. Buddha said, perhaps, all this reason that some people claim that they have become Pataya Buddha, or they have become such and such Bodhisattva, or just one time only return and never come back again, etc., etc., at different levels. And they want offering from the people, greedy offering. Because some believers, they offer anything. So that's all the reason the Buddha suspects why somebody proclaimed that they have attained this and that when they have not, okay? Now the Buddha continues. These Ichantikas, meaning the great liars, Ichantika is a Sanskrit term for such kind of people who lie about enlightenment and their saintly status. That's Ichantikas, yeah? Not normal liars, these are Ichantika, I mean greatest liar, the worst liar, yeah. These Ichantikas destroy the seeds of Buddhahood just as surely as a taller tree is destroyed if it is chopped down. A taller tree or any tree, okay? If you chop down a tree, it's chopped down, right? No more chance to live. Similarly, these Ichantikas, I mean the greatest liar people, cut down their seat of future enlightenment, of Buddhahood, like a tree being chopped down. This is so bad when you lie about your achievement in spiritual practice. should never do that. If you lie about something else, mundane way, or because of uh, any necessity, good excuses, maybe still can be redeemed. You can still be helped and saved and become Buddha, but if you lie, as a Ichantikas, then you finished. You can never be anywhere near Buddhahood. You cut off your seat of enlightenment, of Buddhahood. So you'll be recycling yourself as ghosts and demons and the most is, you know, low divas in the low heaven or Ashura, okay? Have power, have retinues, have followers, have the magical power and all that. But you will never become a Buddha. So beware of that. Buddha continued, I command the Bodhisattvas and Ahabs to appear after my extinction in response bodies in the Dharma ending age. Response body is similar to the uh, light body. Transformation body, light body. You know, not the real physical body, but the appearance of the body in light. So the Buddha appealed to the Buddha, Bodhisattva and the Ahats in the future, use their transformation body uh, in the Dharma ending age, when the Buddha uh, has gone to their Nirvana a long time, maybe three, five hundred years after, and to take various forms in order to rescue those in the cycle of rebirth. Yeah, because Ananda has asked how he can help. So the Buddha keeps saying all this method. And he even appealed to all the uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to help other sentient beings after he's gone. They should either become shramanas, white robed lay disciples, kings, ministers or officials, virgin youths or maidens, and so forth. Remember, he said, appear in various forms, use a transformation body to appear as if you are king, queen, etc. So some kings and queens are not, maybe not real physical king and queen, but the manifestation of the bodies. If they are benevolent and kind, then maybe they are a bodhisattva manifestation. Okay. And so forth. And even prostitutes, widows, Profligates, thieves, butchers, or dealers in contraband doing the same things as these kinds of people. Why? They praise the Buddha vehicle and cause them to enter somebody in body and mind. So the Buddha appeal, requests all the future monks, 
nuns, bodhisattva, saints, to please use their power of transformation to appear in different field of life, in different jobs, in different positions, even as prostitutes, as butchers, to doing the same job with them. Appear like a prostitute with the prostitutes people, and therefore mingling with them, and then slowly teach them, inspire them to know the Buddha teaching, the saintly teaching. So how much sacrifice any Buddha or Bodhisattva has to undergo, nobody would know. Even become prostitute, even become butcher. Though these are even against the precept. But you, as Bodhisattva, must do it, so that you can befriend these kind of people. They are very difficult for any prostitutes or butchers to understand anything about Dharma, about true teaching. So you even have to appear to be like them and then bring them into the true path. So we should never look down upon anyone in any position, any job, however lowly or however despicable in our opinion. We should always have respect because they have Buddha nature inside anyway. Hmm? Okay? One time I recite a poem about an uh, artisan, you know, artisan or a prostitute, how sad she was when her so-called client left her in the middle of the night. She begged him to stay, and he did not. And one of uh, your brothers criticized me, saying, Master, that's a prostitute poem that you recite. And I say, she is a Buddha too. And at that time, I really meant it, and I really understood it. I don't just say that, but I really know it. Many things, just like when you understand it, but you cannot explain it to others. Yeah, yeah, because you just enlightened at that moment for that thing, that subject, that object alone, yeah? One time I read one sentence in some of the Zen book, you know, meditation book, Zen book somewhere. It say like this in Chinese, okay? I repeat Chinese first so that I can remember in English. Uh, Means I am enlightened all by myself. No one is my master. I really understood that sentence, deeply understood, knowingly, and know it so well, clearly, to me. So, oh, I feel very good. I taught the disciples in Taiwan at that time. I said, you repeat all this. Is this a true? Is it a true? I even forget that I'm their master. If I told them to, to repeat like that, how would they even respect me anymore? I did not care because I understood the true meaning of it. So I taught all of them at that time, repeat after me. <laughs> I alone enlighten myself. No one is my master. Repeat it. And every day we do that. Uh, okay. Uh, and one of my so-called non-resident disciple. And she went to America to give initiation to some people in America. And I told her, you have to tell them also after initiation to repeat this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and the nun did. And they revolt against her. <laughs> they say, she's arrogant. <laughs> and she teaches against my teaching. It's not true. I is the one who told her to say that. Because I realized the, really the meaning of it. And later I say, okay, don't, don't say that no more, because, <laughs> because I realized that it's only me who understood it. And they understand nothing. <laughs> so I realized that enlightenment, you can't pass on, okay? And you, you always enlighten in some, in some subject after another, but not all the time and not in all subject. But when you understand one thing, that is yours. And only yours, yes. And other people might not be able to grasp it. Because it's not the words, it's, it's your realization, it's your enlightenment in it. My God, I thought everybody would understand it. I tell them, go teach them, teach everyone. <laughs> <laughs>
I myself do it the same. Yes. It's it's the rest of the answer to what you asked me earlier about why I was crying yesterday. Because and you it's, realize something. Yeah, it's related to what you're saying now, mm. um, Master. That to be honest, many times I I struggled to know about you or not, and. I always had what I called an internal master, which mm. was a voice that guided me and still told me to listen to you and mm. still told me to trust you and still mm. told me to come here mm. and to follow you. Mm. And I cried yesterday at a moment when they were the same voice at the same time. Yeah. Um, when your voice and my internal master were at the same time speaking, the same voice ah. was one of the moments that I cried. Very good. Um, and what you just said reminded me of, of that. And so I wanted to finish answering your question from before. Very good. <laughs> okay, I was just concerned about you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. That maybe something I said that uh, trigger you or some sadness in you. Okay. That that you might feel guilty about something. Okay. That's all. Okay. Good. Good that you know. Good that you know. Yeah. It's like that. Whatever we know, we just know. We can't explain it to somebody else because it's such a simple sentence. Yeah. I enlighten myself alone. Nobody is my master. And I really know that, what it means. And then I teach everybody because I was so happy this is the truth. <laughs> and nobody understand another. <laughs> and I told my nun to tell the new disciple in America that revolt against her. They wrote a letter to me saying, that nun is very bad. She, she, she told us that you are not our master. <laughs> <laughs> That we alone are our own master. Nobody is master. That means she disregards you. I said, no, no, I told her to tell you. <laughs> God. It was a very funny, funny, uh, years ago, you know, decades ago. But this is like that. And later I realized my, my dumb height, you know, meaning <laughs> my, <laughs> my stupidity. So I tell them, stop it, stop it. They don't understand, so forget that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Just like in some of the Zen, uh, Zen story, uh, one of the masters, you know, uh, yelled very loud into one of his disciples' ears. And then he was dead for three days. <laughs> but then, after he regained his ear sight again, he come and, and cried to his master, complaining, said, I don't hear that no more. Understand? When he was deaf, he heard the inside voice inside music. And when he regained his ear side again, it's usual he tried to listen outside and then he won't get it no more. <laughs> yeah, she made her like that. But don't ask me to yell at you, it's different, okay? <laughs> that master and that disciple is a different situation. Just like I say, I'm alone and enlightened and no one is my master, you know? And I understand that completely. But I don't know how to explain it to you, okay? Okay, now, continue before the calendar ends. <laughs> so the Buddha even uh, encouraged, required, requests of the monks, saint people in the future. After the Buddha went to Nirvana, he said, you do this, do that, do anything you can to awaken other beings, to lead them into the true path, to be even prostitutes, but... Hmm? Imagine, huh? you are saint, enlightened, knowing, and you have to use your power to manifest yourself as a real, like a physical prostitute, as a real physical butcher, in order to befriend these people who are supposed to be in a lowly spiritual level, who has no chance to know any master because of their position, okay? And their background, and their companies, and their job. Very difficult for them to understand anything. So you, the saint, have to use your spiritual power to be like them in order to teach them the right way of life, the right way of life. Even Jesus, Say he forgave the prostitute, meaning he probably gave her initiation, and even his disciple roared at him, hmm? criticizing. 
give her initiation, and then people, his disciples, criticize him. So only enlightened masters are non-judgmental, okay? Uh, so tolerant, so loving, and so kind. I made some offering, a substantial sum offering to a temple in Europe because I knew the old abbot, he's gone now. He's gone now, the new one coming. The old abbot was an ascetic monk, very good monk. He's mostly skinny, and very funny, very funny. He went to my house, sometimes stay in my house, also, of course with other disciples. And he and other monks are very much respectful of me and loving me very much. So I still remember that temple. And I gave some donation to repair the temple and all that. I have reverence and love for the old monk, the former abbot. Sadly, he is gone. Are you better, love? You have the heart pack I gave you? Thank you very much. What's your name? My name is Edwin. Edwin? Yes. Thank you, Edwin. Yes. God bless you. Thank you very much, Master. And take good care of yourself while you are I around will. here because we, we are not like a hotel. You don't have enough comfort for you. Yes. It, we never have because I, too many people, we can never have enough rooms for everyone. Yes, what is it, my love? Hi, hi Master. Hi. This, this is the first time I've come to see you. First and... time I see you. Yes. I see that. We're both the same. <laughs> I've been a Hare Krishna for 15 years. Oh, Hare Krishna to ha you. Hare Krishna Master. Yes. And so many things you've said yesterday and today from the sutras that have made me realize I was with the right guru and he's passed on now. What's and, his name? His uh, Krishna, name? Krishna Das Swami. Oh, yeah. yeah. A loving he, monk. He, he was Master. He, he, he made me feel the love of God than any other person I've ever known. Oh, wonderful for you. Thank you. But I'd like to just say two things now. Mm. His name is Edwin. My surname is Edwin. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I just want to say that everything happens for a reason and I can feel his presence right now. Yes. The, all the points you've made today about the Vedic scriptures... All the, it's the same like your mother is, would say it, to you. Yeah, it, it's exactly I'm sure. and yes. the continuation. But the love of Master, is, there's four words my Guru Maharaj always repeated to me. Please forgive me. I'm not trying to bring... Yeah? Matri, no, no. Yeah. Why? Matri Debo Baba, worship your mother as if she's Lakshmi Narayan herself. What Pit, was that? Ma, Matri Debo Baba. Mat, like Mataji, but Matri Debo Baba. So worship. Any, mat, any female is our mothers. Oh. And we should worship them as if they're God sent by God that way. Okay. Pitri Deva Baba, our fathers are sent to us. Love and respect our fathers. But he always used to say the third one was most important. Acharya Deva Baba. The spiritual master and the guru who's sent, can, they're the only ones who can take us back to God. Yes. Our original mothers and fathers are there. They give us worldly knowledge. They help us. They, they give us all the things we need in this world to yes. equip us for this world. Mm -hmm. But it's only a spiritual master or a guru who can send us back to the spiritual world mm -hmm. and connect us back to God. Just watching, I've watched many of your disciples on different lectures. Mm -hmm. And just watching the way you chastise them for the love of one disciple, Guru Maharaj always used to say, any spiritual master or guru has to be heavy. Because their relationship with their disciples Strict, you mean, is yes. to get them to go back to God. Yeah. Unconditional love. Yes. Master, I'd just like to say thank you. All I've felt here since I've been here for two days is unconditional love. Wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. By the candor of your own disciples, they're, they're a living example to you. And I yeah, they are. And I could... They are. They're, they're, uh, they're absolutely... <laughs> but even this is... We're children. We are yeah, children and we're trying to find our way through. And you've been sent to show us the best way back to God. Thank you, my love. And we're not perfect. But Master, please, thank you very, very much. I really, really do love you from my heart. Thank and you. I will do the best to be one of your, your following disciples. Yeah. Thank you. Bless Hare Krishna, is, Master. Bless is your guru who taught you the right things in the right way and the humility that he taught you. And the enlightenment that he led you to. Please forgive me if I've offended in any way whatsoever. No. I, did, I didn't know the protocol, so I was just holding back. And this was the right moment. Never. Because the young gentleman, the yeah. things he said, yeah. really, really touched me. 
the fact that his inner voice and your voice came to him at the same time, that is probably the most perfect realization one can have. I and your masters are one. Thank you. Really, they're Absolutely. working together to uplift humankind. Yes. We have no competition between each other. We love each other and we are buddies. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Master. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for your loving comments and blessed be your guru forever. May he always guide you and never leave you. Even though with me, my assistant, may he always be your guru, the best, and always guide you in perfection. And may you always remember him, your inner master. <laughs> okay, all right. Ah, this is very emotional to me. <laughs> Any gurus are precious. In India, they revere guru more than God. They say, what got to me? Just throw me into the sea of suffering of existence. Only my guru liberates me, love me, protect me, and take me home. They praise guru all the time. Please forgive me again. I don't mean to interrupt. But there was what you said about the... Because I've followed martial arts all my life. So when you said that about the Sphinx, the Shaolin monks uh -huh. have this... Yeah, yeah, yes. The candles burnt upon their head as a self-sacrifice that they will do the best they can for mankind. Yes. Even what they're learning is to serve their nation, to serve their community. Yeah. So when I heard you say that, after all this time, it was such an enlightening thing to understand why these three... Uh, it was really, really yeah. wonderful. I never mentioned it before. <laughs> yeah, and, and haven't come here... Yeah. All the Shaolin monks, all the Buddha Dharma, everything is yeah. this whole place. <laughs> it just where, happened already. They, yeah, they, absolutely. They There's exist a, before we bought it. Very, so I just keep it as is. No, I was going to uh, maybe ask for Jesus uh, statues outside and some other master yeah. to put around to compete with all these uh, yeah. <laughs> monks. <laughs> some things we have removed. Yes. yes and the uh, ex the former owner removed, but the former owner also vegetarian. That's why we, they were very yes. happy that we bought it. He worried that some other business come in and do the killing and meat yeah. and every, every day, and he's very happy that we're vegetarian. <laughs> okay. Just sorry, just one more thing, and then tell me, tell me what you were saying about the grains. What you explained about Buddha, you know, the Buddha saying about the grains in Krishna consciousness, we keep a kadashi mm -hmm. two days a month, yes. and we fast from grains and beans. So it all ties in. Everything Guru Maharaj just said, mm. you, not only have you confirmed it, but you're taking it to that next level. And in this age, to have a living master gives everything a lot more potent. Mm -hmm. And we need to realize this is not just by chance. Guru Maharaj used to say, we are the most fortunate people on the planet yeah. in this age. It is. But we're the yeah. most unfortunate because at every given moment, we will turn our backs on God through some kind of distraction. Mm. We know the names of God. We know his love. Mm. And yet at every given moment, something will, Maya will play with us. Mm. But we are the most, in this age of Kali Yuga, we're the most treasured. Yeah. Because every person we meet, we're given God's name or his love in some way. Yes. And your disciples do live to this. Mm. You're the first person I hear who talks about the planet or the cosmos or the universe as one. Mm. You care so much about all the living beings. Just to see this. I remember just, when I watched the lecture. Just natural. Yeah, it just... But everyone is trying to destroy the world. Everyone is arguing in the world. Everyone is upset with their neighbors. And here comes Master who just talks about saving the planet. I remember watching you cry in one of your lectures because of so many animals that had perished. And, and it just left me. That evening, it was just a totally, totally... I got introduced to you five years ago. Mm. And I've just always, always been interested. And to be sitting here now... Listening to you is almost like I'm listening to the lecture. I had trouble focusing on you because I'm trying to be. So please forgive me. I will not take up no one else's what time. What are you doing? No, no. Thank you, everyone. What are you thank saying? you so much. Uh, it, you it, this is for everybody. It's, it's, it's a retreat. and it's You are enlightening people. It's very good. No, thank so, you very much. So they don't look at my calendar that you look no, at. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're saving me. <laughs> Yeah, it's good that you uh, say something that is so noble and kind. It's uh, you uplifting them, you enlightening them. Yes, and I'm so proud to have you among this congregation. Huh? Yeah, continue to be a good monk. 
continue to be a good nun, okay? And the Korean nun or whomever, where are they? Normally, I said a long time ago, the nuns and the monks should sit in the front so that you don't rub ever with them and keep them more pure. There's a Korean monk there, nun said, you come sit here. The nuns and the monks come sit here. I just don't want people to rub off on you some of their mundane energy. If you like, please sit here. Huh? Normally, I tell them to let the monks and the nuns sit kind of a little separately, distantly. They have forgotten. And I can't keep saying that every day, you know. No matter if you think you're equal to them or not, you're monks and nuns and you deserve more respect and distance, okay? So you feel like you're still at home. When you go out and preach and then you mingle with people, it's different. Here, come here, sit. <laughs> Yeah, if you like to there, it's fine. And the Hindu nun, you stay there. Okay, you sit. Come uh, <laughs> That's all I know. Anashio. <laughs> <laughs> and Hindi, I don't know much. Only bahut acha, bahut acha, bahanji, sister, great sister. G is the mean great, okay? So if you don't know any other Hindi, you just say, Namaste G, G, then it's fine. People know you respect. Okay, can I continue now? You have any more? No. Oh. So your calendar is very short. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was happy that he take over some of my calendar. <laughs> now he stopped. <laughs> Be feel free, okay, to speak anything you want. You also? Okay. Ah, good, wonderful. I can forget my calendar for now. <laughs> I just, Tell me. One question on the yes. poem that you were talking about that was you were reciting, that you said that you knew she was a Buddha, that poem? The poem? Yes. You said you, you knew she was a Buddha or something? Yes, yes. Uh, were you saying, like, she had come back as from... As a Buddha, or she was like, we're all No, Buddha, I said, she had, she's also the Buddha. I mean, everyone has Buddha and, inside. That's what, I, okay. That's what I was just wanted to clarify. Okay, okay. I did not predict anything. I just looked as no, a soul level. I didn't, know she, I didn't know she was... No, 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 back. it's not like, like that, no. Okay. I just said it as a fact that she has Buddha inside, and we should have the same respect. And I say that because that moment of realization, of true statement, okay, but if I say that to other people, maybe they don't understand what I'm talking about. Maybe that's why you're a little bit confused. I did not predict. I state the fact that she's a Buddha, so there's no need for him to, to talk to me like that about her. Uh, that's what yeah. I was thinking, but I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, it's clear now? Thank you. Okay. I thought you took over my calendar, but you just have a short question. Fine. So I still have to continue. <laughs> okay. When I said that to that Vietnamese disciple, I really understood that. I really meant it as well. But when I say it now, it's not the same like at that moment. Because I really meant that. I really knew that. I really understood that she's a Buddha inside. I look at the soul level, you know. Sometimes I look in different eyes. Different eyes. Yeah? I... I had a question, actually. Something you said a long time ago mm. um, made me think of something. But since you're inviting calendar talking, I figure I'll ask. Um, it's about doubt, Master. I, I wonder about how doubt works in the mind. Because it's interesting that sometimes it seems not like my mind is doubting something that it believes. It's like I have two minds, one that believes and uh -huh. one that, that doubts. Yes. Um, Earlier today, for example, I, I discovered a tree in the, mm. our meditating area. Mm. And it was like, a it was a very powerful tree. It kind of called out to me and mm. I touched it and it, it felt like maybe Buddha tree or something like that. Mm. Um, and I felt this powerful energy from it, but mm. I, I doubted it. And I, I, had my, I, ha I had somebody else come and I just said, hey, touch this tree. And they did, and they smiled for a second. And then after a few seconds, I saw like the, this tree reaction. And you, I'm like, oh, you feel it too. You too feel and, it. And, and I knew that it was true. But then uh -huh. also the other side, the other brain doubted it. And I had another person <laughs> touch the same tree and uh -huh. watch the same thing okay. on their face a third time. And yes. I know 
in my heart that this tree is powerful. Still doubt. There's still that voice somewhere in the brain that says, <laughs> no, you know, and I don't Kill know that voice. <laughs> how? How do I kill that voice, Master? Just ignore it. Okay. You are a smart person. You should know which is correct, which is not. I do. Yeah, so then but the listen voice to yourself. But the voice still talks to me. Uh, ignore it, okay? okay? Okay. You are a smart person. You know what's right, what's wrong, okay? Okay. No need to doubt when something is real. I told you guys many, uh, you know, some times ago, last year or something, in one of the lectures, I say in Sihu, I say, this tree, that tree, that, many of them on the fifth level even, mm. uh, at least third level or four level. I found one of them. Yes. So they are in the world to bless the world. How else would they be able to give oxygen to us? I say all the trees, you know, some of them very high level. And I point to some of the trees and see what I said, they are fifth level, okay? And they're blessing the world. And we are the one who kill them without thinking, okay? So you experience one of that. But if you touch a tree again tomorrow, you might not feel the same, okay? It might not uh, reveal itself to you. Okay, so don't be surprised if tomorrow you come touch and, huh, nothing happened. Maybe I was wrong yesterday, and you doubt again. <laughs> don't do that. Be spontaneous. Be a child. Except you become a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is kingdom of God? Is, is this blissfulness that you feel inside, the happiness, you know, the childlike innocence, fearless, okay? Only love and happy, happiness. That is a child. The kingdom of childhood, okay? Kids, they don't fear anything. They're always happy, okay? All right. I'll tell you one story. When sometimes when your mind is pure, you perceive things around you, and other time you don't, okay? Uh, one time I was in Sihu. Mm, I took care of some of the workers, no? I mean, SMTV worker or some resident, and I told them they have to buy a sofa because it... it the office is very austere, you know, only a table and uh, a swivel chair, yes, and, uh, and a computer, <laughs> nothing else, austere. We were so hurried to make the SMTV that I have not allowed time to do the decoration for them. I said, we have to do it now. The war is starting soon. We must do it now. Forget about decoration because I promised a mother to another two months until the office finished. I said, why? It's all done, we have table, we have chairs. Oh, we still need to decorate. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> we have to begin now. So we begin without any ado, you know, without any picture or decoration on the wall, nothing, okay? But I say, you have to be comfortable, yeah, because you work all day and you need some sofa, okay? Sometimes if you're tired of sitting, maybe you can recline on the sofa and do some computer work. So I told them... <laughs> Why are you laughing? It's what I told him, okay? Uh, longer sofa and comfortable so that you can even, you know, resting while you're working. Or when you need to take a rest, a little nap at midday, after lunch, or you just sit there comfy to meditate. Uh, they also have cushion, of course, and all that. But I say, no, sofa is more comfortable so you can meditate. Uh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I told them to buy some sofa. Okay, they bought similar sofa for everybody, including for me. Oh, I told them I hate this sofa. Ah, <laughs> uh, because it's so narrow, you know, and uh, very high in the back is okay. It's not all that. I say I don't really like this sofa very much. I imagine you would buy f because I didn't see their sofa yet. I only knew my sofa. It's a very narrow and a very high in the back, okay? I say, you okay with all this? They say, okay, master, okay, we're okay with our sofa. Very comfortable, very comfortable. <laughs> to meditation or resting, you know? I say, you can also sit there while you're eating, you know, take a rest from your computer. Yes, yeah, put your feet on, or meditate, or eating, you know? Relax, yeah, so you don't... Always have to work too hard, you know, all the time. Take a break. Sit on the sofa, lay on it, do whatever. Uh, read a book or whatever. Okay, fine. 
listen to music, whatever. Okay. So we bought many so far. I say buy as many as you can put in your room without crowding it, yeah? Without uncomfortably crowding it. So they bought many. And they bought some for me too. One. And I said, I don't like my sofa. You like yours? Oh, yes, we're very comfortable. We love it. We use it every day. I said, okay then, as as long as you like it, it's okay. I don't want to keep changing my sofa again because it's heavy, you know? People have to buy it and bring it in, bring it out. So I said, okay, I accept my sofa, but I don't like it. I'm always very straight like that. Whatever I don't like, I cannot say, oh, I like, or it's okay. I just say, I don't like. (laughs) And loud and clear, but accepting, okay? I accept things doesn't mean I like it. I like things doesn't mean I have to have it, okay? So it's just like that. Okay, one day, after a, a while, you know, I went to their office. And I, I don't want to see how, what they're working, if anything I could do to help to make them more comfortable, okay? Oh, they have good kitchen at that time. Big, big, big refrigerator. A good sink, everything brand new, everything, okay, comfortable. Not luxury, but comfortable. I said, oh, I like your kitchen. I will move in here, man. <laughs> I say that. And then I go to see their sofa. And I say, wow, this is exactly the sofa I want you to have. You know, oh, bright color, whitish color, and white with the curving a little bit back. It's like a, like a reclining sofa, but very big, white, uh, leather-like, but it's not leather, okay? Look very luxury and comfortable, inviting and big. You can sleep on it all day. So, wow, this is what I want. How come you don't buy me this kind of thing? <laughs> and they told me, Master, you have the same sofa. I say, what? No, it's not the same. Mine is green color, and the back is high, and the front is narrow. This is luxury, you know? Big, long, reclining, look like a royalty. And they're all very dumbfounded. Master, you had exactly the same. I said, all right, okay, never mind. I don't mind. It, whatever, okay, as long as you're comfortable, at least you're comfortable. And I keep wondering about it, why they lie to me. <laughs> I know my sofa. It's not like that sofa. I know it. <laughs> and later I keep calling one after another. I say, tell me what kind of sofa you have there. <laughs> just tell me, just between you and me. <laughs> Master, you know it. It's the same in your office. I say, no, I want the truth. I say, Master, I swear to God, it's the truth. <laughs> okay. I say, they are not very honest to me. I say nothing. I ask the other guy, describe to me the sofa that I saw the other day. <laughs> that I look in front of it and I say, it's a beautiful sofa. Describe it to me in color, detail. How big, how long, detail, color. What kind of color? And they told me exactly the same. Exactly the same like the other guy. It greenish, you know. <laughs> I say, is it big in the front? No, it's it, uh, okay, about this big. Then it's the same like my sofa. How about behind? It's like this high, the same as my sofa. No, not again. I told you, tell me the truth. I just want to know why you told me it's the same as my sofa. But it's not the same at all. Why would I praise a sofa when I don't like it? <laughs> you know? If I don't like my sofa, why I praise the same one in your office? You know I'm very straight and honest. I never say things that is not true. No, Master, it's the same one. <laughs> Three, four of them, and all of them tell me the same thing. Oh, I was very frustrated. So I said, okay, tell me, is there another sofa somewhere that has been moved? Maybe before I was in your office, now it moved somewhere without you guys knowing. No, Master, he's always been here. He never has any other sofa anywhere else in the whole ashram. I say, how about in International Garden? Is it the same? I say, similar, Master, just different color. I say, what color? I say, green is also. I can't believe it. <laughs> and, then, and then they know each other. They say, yeah, Master, stand in front of that sofa and praise it. I say, she loved that style and that sofa. It's not. Just my eyes, see different. It's the same sofa, (laughs) exactly the same. They buy many and they give me one. And they have six, for example, like that. 
But I saw that day is completely different. It's the ideal so far that I wanted them to have. What I wanted them to have in my mind is exactly the same as what I saw that day, but it doesn't exist at all anywhere in the ashram. <laughs> Nobody ever bought it. Nobody ever saw it. It's not anywhere. I asked the whole ashram, everybody, nobody saw anything like what I said. So you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I think so. Yeah? I'm enjoying the story okay, either okay, way. Okay, You don't believe me, you ask some of the SMTV people. Yeah, yeah, the story is still circulating somewhere, but they probably think I'm cuckoo, you know? <laughs> How can I explain that? I said, really? It cannot be optical illusion because it's, the color is all different. The size is different. The style is very royal-like, you know, beautiful, reclining kind of sofa in your, you know, beautiful mansion somewhere. White color instead of green. How can you see green into white? I'm not colorblind. I saw all the color. This is pink, okay? This is creamy color. This is deeper pink. And this is yellow, uh, yeah, lemon yellow, for example. I know all the color. This is... Purplish, okay? <laughs> this is deep purple, this is green. I'm not colorblind, I passed my driving license. <laughs> it's apple, red, green, mm? <laughs> white. <laughs> mauve color, they call it mauve, something like that. Skin color, okay, kind of. I'm not colorblind. How can a green sofa appear into white, sleek, and shining leather-like, but it's not leather, very inviting, very comfortable, like you could stay there, sleep all day. And that's the sofa I wanted them to have. I told them to buy that kind of sofa. So I thought they bought it until I saw the difference. Until now, I still can't figure it out. <laughs> So I asked the heaven, what is it? You tricked me or something? Why, why did I see the, the sofa? I, different color, different style, different size. This is your pure mind and make it like that. Yeah. Just like one day I sat in my office uh, in the old house, I mean, amazing to office with dog sofa and bed all over around me. Yeah? So that I can work and be with dogs same time. There's nothing really much that you can envy. And then I look outside before the dogs came long ago. When I first or second time came back to Taiwan, and I saw outside, oh, it's like Europe. Like European, it's not like the, the scenery that I have seen before, not like Taiwan style, not the same. So I said, where am I? I said to myself, where am I? I thought I came back to Taiwan. How come I am in Europe? The energy. You understand? The scenery and the energy feeling is all Europe. It's not Taiwan at all. Different level of energy, different elevation. So I couldn't believe myself. I thought, I came back to Taiwan already. How come I'm in Europe? <clears throat> Are you there? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm in Taiwan. Because the, the old table and all that is a Taiwan. It's just around, surrounding is like Europe. So I call everybody <laughs> again. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> Even one sister, the cook from Loving Hood in, in Austria, you know? I call her also, after all, because I don't believe the Taiwanese people. I thought that they just say what I want to hear. So I call a Vietnamese cook. So I call her last, you know, last minute. And last one I call her. Am I still in Austria with you? Am I in somewhere in Europe? Are you coming here with me or you came after? Am I, where am I? Am I in Taiwan or in why? I know I went back to Taiwan. How come I see Europe? She said, you are in Taiwan, master. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I said, okay, I give up. Whatever, as long as I feel good. Yeah, the energy is elevated into different kind of more developed type of country. Taiwanese people, they're very kind, but they're very casual about their environment. Many places are very casual, you know? Maybe they're more inside. They don't care much of the outside, yeah. Uh, I'm telling you, yeah. There's no end to all kind of things that I saw, yeah. 
Master, talking about the trees and the energy, I was recently in Vancouver, Canada, mm -hmm. and my husband took me into a little village called the Whistler. It has three beautiful lakes, like the one oh, picture one. behind mm -hmm. you, yes. Mm -hmm. And talking about trees, I was so touched. We went into mountain uh, to look the waterfalls, mm. and coming inside, mm. humongous big trees. A moment I stepped inside of the starting in a in a in a wood area, I'm feeling the vibration of the tree, but immense love. Mm. Lo I start crying, mm. and my husband was in front of me. He looked back, and he said, what happened? I said, I just felt the love, love from the, from tree, the trees. The forest, yes. I was just going and touching them and sending the love back mm, yeah. to them. It was so touching yeah. that the energy of love mm. and the vibration, so beautiful, yeah. pure love yes. giving. They are giving yes. us love. That's so true. That's beautiful. Is true. That is true, when you can experience that. This is true like that. Every being is living, yeah, and very pure inside. If you tune into them, if you can, and they really talk to you, they really send you love and send you enlightenment, encouragement, yeah, all kinds of things. Uh, yes, yes, okay. Hi, Master. Hi. This is the first time being here. Uh, oh, it's fancy, wait, me yeah. too. Yes. <laughs> And um, waiting for this moment, 20 years, yes. Oh. Um, I just want to say thank you. And in these days, um, I feel m much love. Uh, I have been seeing you inside, uh, like um, you in different time of life, mm. um, different uh, manifested bodies mm. in all these days, mm. all, all the time. Yeah, I don't have words for express uh, oh. how I am feeling. Okay, <laughs> no. just love. Okay, um, enjoy. Thank, thank you. you. And brothers and sister from Peru wants to. Oh, they're lovely people. Manifest uh, their love. Too. Oh, lovely. Please send them my my regard also. Yeah, my love. Yeah. Okay, we go back to the Buddha now, huh? Okay, the Buddha said that people should not be lying should not tell lies. And then the Buddha said conclusively that this is the fourth clear and unalterable instruction on purity given by the thirst-come ones and the Buddhas and the world-honored ones in the past, and also him as well, past, present, meaning is a true teaching from all the saints, not just the Sekamoni Buddha. Good. So he said... Therefore, Ananda, one who does not cut off lying, is like a person who carves a piece of human excrement, excuse me, he said, to look like Chandana, I mean, maybe uh, sandalwood, something. Uh, he wants to carve a tattoo from sandalwood, but he used excrement instead, hoping to make it fragrant. Yes, sandalwood. Yeah? He, he, want, he hoped that piece of <coughs> poo become sandalwood. He is attempting the impossible. Wow, that extreme, the Buddha warns you, warns us, that if you don't keep the precept, even just one of them, like the lying precept, saying the truth, if you don't keep it, if you don't avoid lying, then you are attempting the impossible, like making a piece of pool become a sandalwood statues like that. Okay? I teach the bhikkhus, the Buddha said. I teach the monks that the straight mind is the bodhimanda, mean the method of cultivation. Straight mind, you must have. Mean clean, honest, huh? Keeping precept, and that they should practice the four awesome departments in all their activities, since they should be devoid of all falseness. How can they claim to have themselves attain the abilities of a superior person? I mean, if they're not 
are full of truth, yeah? If they are just falseness, then they cannot claim to be a superior person, meaning like sainthood or somebody of great moral principle. That would be like a poor person falsely calling himself an emperor. For that, he would be taken and executed. Wow, that extreme. If we don't keep the precept, this is truly that extremely unfavorable for our practice. It's like the opposite, the opposite uh, direction. Somebody don't translate to you. You okay? Sava, <laughs> Bono, <laughs> Bono. Mm. Okay. He just so mesmerized. He just then he forget to help you translation. <laughs> he just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> you saw the light? Big, big, big light, big light. Big light, where? See, it shocked me, sorry. I saw. Uh, my light? Uh, he, he very, very bright. Very bright, sorry. so you forgot. I, I, I forgot, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. Good. <laughs> you have good excuse. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive him. <laughs> it's good excuse, I really mean it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I saw him like... Uh, Steve, you know, sitting there. <laughs> so it's okay. If you see the light, bless you. Good. Good excuse. Really mean. Okay. Don't worry. Continue to see the light. Thank Forget you. about him. <laughs> light is more important. <laughs> and later you can tell him, okay? okay. Or he can listen again by from SMTV. Okay, sorry, or, Master. Uh, it's all right. You see, the light is good for you. <laughs> very, very bright. Yeah, and bigger, I'm glad. bigger, 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 bigger. Yeah, I'm glad you did. Okay, <laughs> so don't worry. I forgive you. Okay, thank mm. you, Master. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad for you. Why forgiving? You do nothing wrong. Mm. <laughs> I'm just feel sorry for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have to learn English. Huh? I told everybody learn English. The most common language. Yeah. Easy to translate, easy to understand. Do you understand? <laughs> good, very good. <laughs> okay, so the Buddha say, if we don't keep the precepts, the moral principle, okay, by avoiding tell lie, by being honest, by being compassionate, no killing, no eating meat, by uh, being pure, yeah, in body and mind, then if we practice, it's as if we falsely claim that we are the king and we will be chop head. That extreme, that dramatic, that's what the Buddha wants to really, really tell us. It is really important to keep precept. Mm? He went into all these extreme examples to make us really understand and believe what he's saying. The Buddha don't tell lie, okay? He would never. What for? He's a monk, okay? He don't tell lie. He has no reason to. Hmm? He has no reason. If you keep a precept or not keep a precept, would the Buddha become any better huh? for himself, benefit him in any way? Make him fatter, more handsome, more worship? No? Yes or no? no? No. So he has no reason to tell his monks any lie at all. So he told the truth. Yeah? Even then he went to all the extreme uh, parable uh, examples so that really they have to know this is very, very, very important to keep the moral standard. Huh? Okay. My humble opinion. Okay. Now, much less should one attempt to usurp the title of Dharma King. When the cause ground is not true, the effects will be distorted. One who seeks the Buddha's body, in the Buddha wisdom, enlightenment, yeah. in this way is like a person who tries to bite his own navel. Can you do that? <laughs> I can. <laughs> no, I cannot. Meaning impossible. 
Can you buy your navel? No. No? Ah, you know. Even Supreme Master cannot. <laughs> you think Master can do everything? <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> Buddha means impossible. If you don't keep the precept, it's impossible for you to be anything but these above men and demons, ghosts, and uh, whatever, Yaksa, huh? Dracula, whatever he meant. Yeah. So, who could possibly succeed? He asked a question, but the question answers itself. So, if monks' minds are as straight as the lute string, lute have strings, like an instrument, musical instrument, mm. if the bhikshu's minds are as straight as the lute strings, true and real in everything they do, then they can enter samadhi and never be involved in the deeds of demons. I certify that such people will accomplish the bodhisattva unsurpassed knowledge and enlightenment. Uh, he guaranteed that even from the mouth of the Buddha. He guaranteed that if, if we kept the precept and seeking enlightenment through meditation at the same time, he guaranteed that you will be enlightened. You'll be a saint. Yeah. So believe the Buddha, even if you don't believe me. Okay. What I have said here is the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha said again, any explanation counter to it is the teaching of the Papian, means heretic. Oh, it's one o'clock, not true. <laughs> My calendar really <laughs> run out. <laughs> oh yeah, tomorrow, yeah? We should really thank the past masters, monks and nuns and scholars who have taken time to record the Buddha's teaching after the master's nirvana. And also for the past and present persons, lay or monks and nuns who have really dedicated themselves, sacrificed their time and precious health or under any difficult situation to translate this so that I can read it to you. And we have to thank them. And may they be blessed forever by all the Buddhas, past, present and future. May their merit be immense. May they be liberated forever. Thank you. <laughs> okay, cut and call long enough. Thank you. Ah, I thank you for being patient and listening with awe and ooh, ah, and <laughs> hurrah and all that. That's really keep me awake. <laughs> thank you, huh? Yeah, for understanding and thank you for being good. I don't know if I can finish. I don't know if I can finish what I promised you during this retreat, retreat, but we all try. Okay, huh? Amitabha. Yeah. Okay, chocolate. No flakes. Give it to the old brother Leech. Here. I have so much respect and regard for you guys. Oh, high in age and uncomfortable still for all the way here to sit on the floor. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Share with your neighbor, okay? Yeah. Sharing. Sharing is a virtue, right? <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you.
Love you, love you. Buddha bless you. God bless you. All the master gurus bless you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for being good. See you tomorrow. ที่เคารพเราชื่นชมที่ท่านมารับชมสำหรับรายการในวันนี้เรื่องสูรางคมสูตรคำสอน4ี่ข้อที่ชัดเจนและไม่เปลี่ยนแปลงในเรื่องความบริสุทธิ์และเว้นจากการรักขโมยและเก่าเท็จตอนที่7ของ7ตอนในระหว่างอาจารย์และลูกศิษย์โปรดติดตามชมโทรทัศน์สุพิมมาสเตอร์สำหรับรายการเชิงบวกที่มากกว่านี้รายการต่อไปคือรายการชุดหลายตอนในคำพยากรณ์โบราณเกี่ยวกับโลกของเราคำทำนายแห่งยุคทองตอนที่36พระแม่ไตยาพุทธเจ้าและการชุมนุมที่ยอดเยี่ยมและมีสเสน่ห์น่าดึงดูดใจหลังจากข่าวเด่นขอให้อาณาจักรแห่งสวรรค์ประทานแด่คุณด้วยความสง่างามทางจิตวิญญาณ Let's p e c t a t e viewers. We appreciate your company for today's episode entitled "The s u r a n k a m a s u t t a The four clear and unalterable instructions on purity, r e f r a i n s from stealing and lying, past seven of seven, on between master and disciples. Please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television for more positive programming. Coming up next is multi-part series on ancient predictions about our planet, prophecy of the golden age, part 36, m a t r i a Buddha and the splendid and glamorous gatherings, right after not w o r t h y news. May the heavenly realms endow you with spiritual splendor. Our programs offer many languages. Please visit suprememastertv.com/schedule and suprememastertv.com/bmd.